Friday service. I'd like to invite you to please stand as we begin our service by reading God's word. Uh, may the Holy Spirit guide us into a deeper knowledge and worship of Christ Jesus and what his sacrifice at Calvary meant for us. We'll be reading from Hebrews 9, 11 to 14, and let's read all four verses together. All right, ready, begin. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the bloods of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serving the living God? Please bow your heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, you have led us singing to the cross where we fling down all our burdens and see them vanish, where our mountains of guilt are leveled to a plain, where our sins disappear, though they are the greatest that exist and are more in number than the grains of the sand. For there is power in the blood of Calvary destroyed sins more than can be counted. You have given us a spring of life that washes clear and white, and we go as sinners to its waters, bathing without hindrance and without price. At the cross, there is free forgiveness for the poor and the lowly, ample blessings that last forever. O Lord, forever will your free forgiveness live that was gained by your blood. In the midst of a world of pain, it is a subject for praise in every place, a song on earth, an anthem in heaven, its love and virtue knowing no end. We have a longing for the world above, where multitudes sing the great song. For our soul was never created to love the things of earth. Though here our spiritual state is frail and poor, we shall go on singing Calvary's anthem. May we always know that a clean heart full of goodness is more beautiful than a lily. That only a clean heart can sing by night and by day. That such a heart is ours when we abide at Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together as we sing the wonderful cross.
Blood beneath. 
Uh, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker tonight. Uh, his name is Tuvia Zaretsky, and he is one of the founders of the Jews for Jesus ministry. And he began his service with that ministry beginning in February of 1974. He was raised in Northern California in the institutions of American Judaism, and he came to believe in Yeshua, Jesus, in 1970. During his career, Tuvia has provided leadership for Jews for Jesus, uh, the branches in Chicago, New York, Boston, Los Angeles, and Tel Aviv. He's also the founder of JewishGentileCouples.com, which is a free counseling service for intercultural couples. Tuvia earned a Master of Arts in Missiology in Judaic Studies at the Fuller Seminary School of World Mission and the Doctor of Intercultural Studies degree from Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. He is married to Ellen, who is also a Jewish believer in Jesus. And they have three adult children, and by God's wonderful grace and blessing, three grandchildren as well. So if you can join me in welcoming Tuvia Zaretsky. Thank you. And Rich, thank you. Thanks for the welcome here. Thank you. And shalom. shalom. I'm delighted to do this, especially on Good Friday. The presentation is called Christ and the Passover. And as you came in, I hope you got one of these uh, brochures. Is there anybody that still needs one? It's for you to take home with you. Um, we've got a couple down here. Thank you. Thanks for being out there and, and greeting people. Stay warm, okay? <laughs> um, inside, you'll find uh, a lot of information that you can take home and kind of be a reminder for what I'm sharing tonight. There's also a, a coupon on the end here, and I'm going to encourage you right now to just tear that off, fold a couple times on the perforation, then tear it off, because I want to give you something. A lot of people want to know, how does somebody with a name like Tuvia Zaretsky end up in my church? Um, I was born and raised in the institutions of American Judaism. I didn't know anything about Jesus. It wasn't until I was in my early 20s that I became curious as God began to make himself known to my life. I didn't want to know Jesus because of all the terrible things that had been done to the Jewish people in the name of Jesus and allegedly by what we thought were Christians. But at the age of 13, I was in a synagogue, and I shared from the prophet Isaiah his message when Isaiah was called to serve God. He heard God calling, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah responded, saying, He nay ni, here am I, send me. See the little pamphlet on the right side, the little booklet? I wrote that because that, that became the heart of my testimony. I was out here in the Inland Empire calling out to God while working with the drug clinic because I didn't have any answers to help kids. And when I realized that uh, I, I had nowhere else to look, I spoke to a, a professor and a PhD in psychology who was on the general board of our drug clinic out in Redlands, Yucaipo. She tried to talk to me about Jesus, and I let her know I'm Jewish. Jews don't do Jesus. So when I was asking for answers, she said, well, why don't you ask God, since I wasn't accepting any of her answers. And I asked her, why should God be talking to me? The last time I talked to God, I was 13. And I asked him why he didn't show up at my bar mitzvah with the rest of my relatives. I said, Hineni, here am I, but where are you, O oh God? 10 years later, she said, well, God made a promise. If you ask, you'll receive. If you seek, you'll find. And if you knock, the door will be open to you. Whose words are those? She didn't tell me that. <laughs> and it was a good thing, too, because if she told me those were the words of Jesus, I would have discounted them. I was so close-minded, so ethnocentric, I wouldn't even begin to hear something from Jesus. The words of God. OK. I went out to the San Gogonio wilderness and I prayed, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to know the right God. I'm asking, seeking, and knocking. Who are you? And how am I doing? He answered part B first. 
you're a broken sinner. And the rest of it was where he introduced himself to me in the person of Jesus. Now, I don't have time to tell all that story and all the details of how he accomplished that, but that little booklet will tell you. And if you'd like to, if you'd like to get a copy of it, I'll send it to you for free as a digital PDF if you'll just leave me an email address and your name and leave that with me tonight on that card. You don't have to give a gift. Just write your email and your name on there and I'll send the PDF with the story. Here am I, God, but where are you? I found him in the person of Jesus. So I'm blessed to be here tonight as a brother in Christ and uh, to be sharing with you this celebration of Christ in the Passover. We're going to focus tonight on why our Jewish people were called to celebrate the festival of Passover. And you're going to see that Jesus celebrated that festival because he came to fulfill it. And in doing that, he called all of us, those who belong to him, to remember what he has done at the cross of Calvary. So join with me tonight. We're going to look at the uh, the Bible, and I'm going to be starting out in, uh, in the Torah in just a moment, in the Exodus. But um, uh, the name of the festival actually is the Feast of Redemption, the Festival of Redemption. And it was the name that God gave, it, gave to it, and it was the, the festival that he gave that our ancestors might remember our redemption. So the, the Feast of Redemption... The joy of this festival was called to help us remember. Now, I think most of us need some reminders, don't we? I don't know about you, but I go through my life. Things happen. Not so good things happen. And I forget, wait a minute, God is here. The Lord is in my life. He makes all the difference. And I need to be reminded to simply trust him, to call on him. Well, God knows that about our nature. And so he embedded in the calendar of Israel this one particular feast that just oozes into our lives. And it comes on the first full moon in the springtime. And that's going to be this year. It's going to be on the 22nd of April. Did you notice about a week ago there's a full moon? Yeah, that was the one just before the full moon of Passover, which is coming next month. So what I want to do is read the passages in the Torah, in Exodus, where God spoke of this night when we were in the land of Egypt. Um, and we tell the story of what happened there in Egypt. Now, here's the focus of it. I'm reading in, Luke, in Exodus chapter 12, verses 12, sorry, chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, and over to verse 11. It's the Lord's Passover. It's not just Israel's Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. He starts out by saying, Your lambs shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. The lamb is at the heart of Passover. The story of the lamb is crucial to the celebration of Passover. And so in Egypt, we would all take a lamb, one year old, a perfect lamb, and tether it by our home. You'll you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats and keep it until the 14th day of the month. That call for the 14th day of the month is the full moon in the middle of a, of a lunar month. Um, Israel is in Asia, okay? For those of us who are from that, that part of uh, the culture of the world, we recognize that a lunar calendar is not that strange. And the middle of the lunar calendar month, the moon is full. And so on the night of the full moon, there in Egypt, in the springtime, we were to take our lambs, set them aside. And all of Israel were to, to do that. But on the night of the full moon, the lambs were to be killed. The blood poured into a basin, and the lamb was roasted over an open fire. Then it says, take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses in which you eat it. And you shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. There are the three things that have to be on every Passover table to make it kosher, to make it ritually proper. A lamb, 
bitter herbs, unleavened bread. You'll see those three as we're still, we talk about the Passover tonight. A lamb, bitter herbs, unleavened bread. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You're going to leave Egypt in the morning. This is your last meal in slavery. And then the, then the capstone. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This isn't Israel's Passover. This is God's Passover. And he gave it to Israel, and through them, spiritually to speak to all the nations, You'll see how that happens shortly. So it's to be a, a night to a feast of remembrance. To remember our redemption. That's the theme. Remembering our redemption. This is Israel's remembrance. But for the rest of the nations, it's a remembrance of who God is and what he has done as well. So we read verses 11 through 14 in, uh, in Exodus. It's a memorial day feast. For I will pass, God says now, for I will pass to the land of Egypt on that night. This is the night of the last of 10 plagues that God brought against Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, telling them, you're no longer in charge. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the one who is sovereign. On that night I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. All the plagues were to ridicule the gods of the Egyptians. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. I am the one true God. I am the Lord, he says. Then he sp speaks about that blood again, the blood of the lamb. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. The blood will be a sign on your behalf to God. When I see the blood, I will pass over you no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So remember, this is God's celebration. This is God's activity. He's demonstrating the might of his arm, his sovereign power, and the fact that he is the God of redemption. This day will be for you Memorial Day. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations and a statute forever you shall keep it as a festival. So it's a, a beautiful time in the year. Our people look forward to it. We remember who God is, what he's done. We prepare our homes in the next couple of weeks. We'll start to prepare our houses, removing all leaven from the home. Leaven is a picture of what? Yeah, it's a, it's a picture of sin, that which puffs up and changes the nature of the lump. So we sanctify our house by removing all leaven, and we prepare the, the night to have all these elements on our table. A lot of the things you see here will be on, on my Passover table with my family as we celebrate Passover this year, and we do continue to celebrate Passover. Not because it's going to gain us any merit with God, not because it's going to save us, but simply to remind us, as God intended, who he is and what he's done. So what's amazing is we find that Jesus celebrated Passover. I didn't grow up reading the, the New Testament. But when I first did, as a Jew looking for the God of my forefathers, I was stunned to find out that Jesus kept Passover. And one of the places we find out that he did that is recorded here in Luke 22. In verse 1, it says, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, called Passover, was approaching. Jesus goes to the city of Jerusalem, where the festival had to be kept. And he brings his disciples with him. And when the, hour, when the day came for the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, two festivals happened concurrently. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, during which we eat the bread that our ancestors ate on the night that we left Egypt and for the week following till we got out into the Sinai wilderness. Also on that night, the lambs were slaughtered. And on that night, we celebrate the Feast of Passover. So Jesus is there with his disciples, and he says to Peter and John, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat of it. Well, preparations 
for Passover, I've already explained, require, first of all, to search for the leaven and cleanse the house and set all things aside. But there are three things that have to be on the table. Remember, I mentioned them reading from Exodus chapter 12. The bitter herbs, the Passover lamb, and matzah. Matzah, the unleavened bread. The Seder plate on the center of the table helps order some of these things. And as a matter of fact, Seder or Seder means order. And it helps us tell the story of the Passover. And you can see all these various items on that, that plate. Those are going to be part of what's the bitter herbs, uh, the Passover lamb. Yeah, it's on there. I'll show you in a moment. And the unleavened bread, which isn't depicted there, but it's, it's coming. So the first thing that you've got to have on that table is maror, the bitter herbs. Uh, and for that, we have onions, horseradish, leeks, garlic, scallions. That's a ground horseradish root on the, the plate. And uh, that's a, you'll see how that fits into all of this. We have to also have the um, zroa, the shank bone of the lamb. A lot of people are surprised to find out that we don't eat lamb at Passover. Well, wait a minute. It's, the lamb is central to telling the story of the Passover. But the rabbis have said, look, we can't eat lamb because it had to be sacrificed at the temple. But the Jerusalem temple was destroyed for the first time in 586 B.C. Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt it, and it was destroyed again by the Romans and has not stood for all these centuries. Our people long for the establishment of the temple because there we hoped that we would meet with the Messiah and he would set up the throne of King David and rule from there again in the future. But now the temple's destroyed and the people living in the land of Israel now, there's still that longing and we even talk about it at, at Passover. But we keep a bone on the table, the shank bone of a lamb that we use to tell the story rather than killing a lamb for Passover. This is central to telling the story of the Passover. Uh, as a circumlocution, a way around not having the altar and the lambs, follow me with this, okay? The rabbi said, well, you have to have a, a seed, a single life that is uh, uh, sacrificed. And so we'll take an egg, which is a single seed. It is hard-boiled. We would break it. Peace is given to everybody at the table. And then we dip it into salt water to remember tears of lamentation for the destruction of the temple. You know what happens? During that period in the Passover service, when we remember that moment and we eat that salt water and the egg, we sing a song. Lashana habab Yerushalayim. Listen to the words for a moment. They're going to sound familiar to you. Lashana habab Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem with Messiah. Sound familiar? I understand you say similar words at the conclusion of your, your communion. Next year in Jerusalem with Messiah. Isn't that amazing? Well, that's part of the, the, telling the story of the Passover. We have the bitter herbs, we have the, the Paschal lamb, and then we have the unleavened bread. Now, I will tell you that I'm very aware of the fact that here in the Western world, we tend to see things according to Western European art, right? Uh, how many here are familiar with Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper? You know what I'm talking about? All the disciples sitting on one side of a table, kind of Middle Eastern, so, Middle Eastern, Middle Ages looking. Leonardo painted everything according to his own culture, as an artist would. You notice the bread on Leonardo's table? What does it look like? Italian bread, right. It's a nice fluffy loaf <laughs> of Italian bread. Passover bread? comes in a box, and it's flat. <laughs> That's a loaf of unleavened bread. Okay, my wife tells me, give Leonardo a break, okay? How are you supposed to paint that? <laughs> it's like a square, you know? So, um, but 
if we're going to talk about Passover and we're going to know, know what was happening in the days of Jesus, we need to know the bread looked like that, it looked like a giant cracker, um, not necessarily always uh, square, but this is the bread that we, and, and we keep the bread on our table actually in a bag, as you see on the screen, called a matzatash, matzah bag, and the, the bag is said to describe unity, and yet it's divided into three compartments. Three pieces of matzah in one bag symbolizing unity. Interesting? I would ask my grandfather, okay, what's with the bag? What's this unity with three in one? My grandfather said, well, those, those represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Then I asked my father next year. Oh, the three in one. They represent the Levites, the Kohanim, the priests, and the rest of Israel. Okay. Now you understand why we say in the Jewish community, where you have three Jews in discourse, you have four opinions floating around. <laughs> I don't know where this comes from, honestly. I've studied, I've looked, I've tried to research it. I've heard all kinds of speculation. We don't know when it started, where it came from. I can tell you that as a Jew who loves Jesus, we trained our children to understand that we still believe there is only one God, but he's made himself known in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, even as the bag which symbolizes unity has three pieces of matzah. As my apologetics professor in seminary said, I guess the easiest way to understand this is one what? God, deity, three who's, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All three are mentioned in the Torah, in the Jewish Bible, in the Tanakh. Ha'av, ha'ben, va'aruch ha'kodesh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not always known as Son, but clearly God who is there in flesh, who appears to wrestle with Jacob, who meets Abraham and has a meal with him. Many times, surprisingly, that God showed up. Well, at our Passover table, we're going to take the second or the middle of the three pieces of matzah. We, uh, we notice it's unleavened. It is uh, broken at our table. Half of it's returned to the bag out of which it was just drawn. The other half is wrapped in a linen cloth called afikomain. He who comes later. Interesting name. Broken, wrapped in linen, buried for a time, or hidden. We'll come back to that. It's a very essential part of telling the story of Passover. It's traditional. And Jewish people around the world, literally around the world, will look for that piece of bread during the Passover celebration. It's as though my people have had their eyes partly blinded. I clearly was in that place, clearly was from that culture, and did not understand many of the things that you're seeing tonight. When we come to our Passover table, by the way, to start the evening, we're going to light candles, uh, and uh, it is, you know, the day on the Jewish calendar doesn't start at midnight. It starts when the sun goes down. So our day, I guess, is just ended, and a new day has begun. And so even right now, we would be saying in Israel and around the world, as the sun has gone down, we would say, Shabbat Shalom, Sabbath peace to you. For now, we have begun the Sabbath rest. We're actually in Shabbat. Saturday has already begun. But we light the candles just before it gets dark, so I'm... I'm not kosher right now, okay? We'll just do it. It's okay. And we light the, ca the candles to, to bring light to our home. Maybe I wasn't so smart to have lit these earlier. Got that one. Can I do it before I get burned? No. Ow. <laughs> okay. That didn't work. That's a big fail. <laughs> um, 
But we would say a blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melar halam asher kedshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu lehad likner shel Pesach. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has commanded us, has sanctified us through your commandments and lighting the lights of Passover. But those of us who are Jewish believers in Jesus, we don't believe that our sanctification is accomplished by keeping commandments. So we've changed the blessing. And it says, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kedishanu b'yeshua hamashiach or haolam. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us in Jesus, the Messiah, the light of the world. And so our ancient heritage and our new covenant faith come together in, that, in this simple celebration at the start of our, our Passover. Jesus sent his disciples. Let's see how they did when they, they prepared the Passover. It says, they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. So far, so good. It says then, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. Re reclined at the table. They're not sitting in chairs, not sitting on a bench like Leonardo painted it. As a matter of fact, because Israel is located in, uh, in Asia, it's an Eastern culture, they were on the floor, pillows strewn about, much like the Korean, Chinese, many of the cultures all across Asia where people are gathered as families uh, in a low table only 18 inches off the ground. Now maybe you'll understand why it says that John had his head against the chest of Jesus. People in the West imagine them sitting in chairs and John doing something like, that is, that's unnatural. It doesn't make sense. But if they're reclining around the table, leaning on pillows, well, it makes all the sense in the world. Of course, that's very natural for that, that part of the culture. It, by the way, if you're invited to a, a Passover at somebody, somebody's home, uh, somebody Jewish, bring a pillow. It's, we, that's what we do. We bring pillows because in the ancient world, we were free. We could recline. A slave had to stand. So just to remember that we were set free, we keep pillows on our chair to remind us that we are reclining on this night. Now I'm going to tell you the truth. Passover lasts three to five hours. This is a matter of survival, okay? You want that on your chair. <laughs> but it's, uh, there's, there is a reason where it goes back to uh, for that celebration. So Jesus is there. They're reclining around the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus knew that he came to the city of Jerusalem to die and fulfill the scriptures. He had been saying this for the length of those three years he was with the disciples. And even on that night, it still wouldn't register for some of them. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus was there for a purpose. We're going to see that purpose very shortly as we tell the story of Passover. And that's why we come to the table. Uh, what you see there is, is Haggadah. It's a book that we use to tell the story of the Passover. Um, and we open it from the front. Hebrew reads right to left, so that's the front of the book. Everything's a little, a little weird, isn't it? It's kind of like taking the red pill I guess. You get to see things a little differently. <laughs> so um, you look in the book and you find beautiful illustrations. Uh, there are diagrams for setting up the table. There are dialogues so the children can have a part in it. There are some funny songs. There are some simple stories that are parables to help us understand what God has done to redeem us. There's unusual foods, as you'll see. But it's all in that book. By the way, I love to encourage Christians to celebrate Passover. It tells the story of our redemption if you understand who the Lamb of God is. So a traditional and a beautiful uh, Haggadah like this won't really help us. 
You know, you can go to the you can go to the grocery store and you can buy some of the the companies um, will sell a, a little Haggadah. They don't talk about Jesus. So those of us with the ministry of Jews for Jesus put together a small Haggadah for Christians called the Messianic Family Haggadah. And uh, I've got some on the table in the, what do you call it, the foyer? Yeah, the, we're all French tonight, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, on your way out, there's a little connect table. And that little book is a way that you can celebrate Passover with your family. It's, look, it reads left to right, so you're safe already, okay? <laughs> Uh, it, there's, it's English, it's Hebrew, there's um, uh, transliteration, so you can read the words. Um, there are songs, and there are parts for the children. So they, they get to participate, and you get to train them to come to know the Lord, who is our Redeemer. And those are on the, they're on the side of the table where there's a price list. And the other side has a bunch of free stuff. This one's not free, okay? I'll be, but I'll be back there to help you if you're interested. A um, lot of fun and really worth doing, spiritually in particular. So that's one of the way we, ways we tell Passover. The other way that we guide ourselves through that long evening, and this is not going to take us three to four hours, okay? Promise. But the way we pace ourselves through the night is everybody has one cup that we're going to raise four times on the night. And each time we raise that cup, it has a different meaning or name. Like the first cup is called the cup of Kiddush, or sanctification by which we set the evening apart to the Lord that we might honor him. It is his Passover after all. Then we're going to, in the, telling the story, we're going to remember the ten plagues that came against the Egyptians and their gods. Remember that? And so we'll remember those ten plagues drinking the second cup of the night. That, by the way, is the only cup that's not mentioned in the New Testament. The other three are. In the middle of the evening, we eat supper, and after supper, we come back and we have the kos hageula, the cup of redemption. And we remember that we have been redeemed out of Egypt, and we rejoice to give thanks to God for what he has done. Again, remembering, remembering, remembering who he is and what he's done for us. Last, the cup of praise, the cup of hallel, and we sing praise songs, and, and we'll conclude with that tonight. So we would expect to find... Um, the cup of redemption, sorry, the cup of praise, sorry, the cup of sanctification at the start of the evening. And uh, we say a blessing, and I'm going to ask you to help me with this. The, the blessing, uh, oops, is in Hebrew, uh, and you'll do it just fine. Okay, I'm going to ask you to sing this with me. Here's your part. You ready? Everybody awake? Okay. This is the practice. It goes like this. Amen. You ready? <laughs> Let's practice one more time. Amen. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. They're all right, Caleb? I think they got it? Okay, here we go. I'm going to say the blessing over the cup. Join with me on this at the, at the end of it. Ready? Baruch atarunai Eloheinu melech haolam Bore pri hagefen. Amen. Nailed it. Excellent. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brought forth the fruit of the vine. Amen. I want you to notice something. At his Passover, at the very beginning, Jesus takes a cup in Luke 22. It tells us in verse 18, this is the first of two cups in Luke's gospel. It says that he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, guess what that thanks was? The blessing, the traditional blessing that we just shared. And the words echo in what he says next. Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Wait. Wait. Words of sadness, words of joy. Sadness, because he says, I'm not going to be able to drink this with you again. I will not drink it again. And then the words of joy. Until. My brothers and sisters, we do believe, amen, that Jesus is coming again. Amen. amen. 
until. I don't know whether it's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb or a huge Passover. Either way, you're all ready. You're going to nail that amen part, okay? We'll do that again. So the story begins. Uh, we, we've come to the table. The food is laid out. We start by telling the story of the Passover. We use the Haggadah. And you'll notice inside of the, your brochure, there are four questions that we ask the children to recite. The first one is, why is this night different than all other nights? And the answer to that, I learned, it's stuck in my memory, okay? I can't get it out of there. This is what I learned about that first question. Why is this night different than all of the nights? On all of the nights we can eat bread with or without leaven. On this night, we eat only the unleavened bread. That's how it goes. The songs, the music, the, the, the words stuck in the memory to remind us all these things that point to a living God and what he has done in the heritage and history of our people. And there are memory triggers, whether it's the things that we eat, the things that we see, the things that we smell. I stand here and there are triggers from back early in my life. So we told the story, and I'm going to go through that now. Um, and I want to go through it in a way that uh, doesn't take us three to five hours, okay? The the story of the Passover has to go all, oh wow, it goes all the way back to Genesis, to the very beginning. How am I going to do this without taking three hours? You'll see. Okay, God creates humanity from the very beginning to love him and to be loved by him. Men and women imbued with dignity, love worthiness, and God's heart for our lives. He also gave us free will. We exercise it against him and we we're, we're enter into death. We begin to die and to die because sin separates us and humanity from God. But right there on the worst of the possible news that you could, they could have gotten, God met them with Genesis 3.15. This is called Good Friday because Jesus died on the cross and was in the tomb. And you say, how could that be good news? Because it meant that salvation had been accomplished. Sometimes the bad news is the start of the good news. Adam and Eve discovered that they could be disloyal, that they could be re rebellious, they could even be disregarding God. And yet in that moment, when death's door opened, God stepped in and promised our redemption and renewal and eternal life. Because he said in Genesis 3.15 that he's going to send the seed of a woman who had crushed the head of a liar who had deceived Adam and Eve, tricked them into the road toward death and sin. And that Redeemer who's going to crush the evil one would be bruised in the process. That was the earliest picture of the seed of the woman who would be the Lord Jesus. But if you need, if you're going to have a, a seed of a woman, you need a family, right? You need a woman and a family and a tribe and a nation. It could have been anybody. It could have been any people. Didn't have to be the Jews. Could have been anybody that God chose. Whoever it was going to be was going to be used of God to accomplish that. And so he calls on Avram, Abram, who became Abraham, the father of many nations. Abraham was not a Jew. He was a Chaldean, the father of many nations, one of which was the Jewish people. But he needed a family and a tribe and a nation and a woman. And so Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They and their wives and children went down into the land of Egypt at a time of famine in the land of Canaan, and they dwelt there for 400 years, during which time the nation grew, or the, the tribes grew, 
from 70 people to 2 million. And there in Egypt, in the backyard of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, this nation became a people. And Pharaoh, the king, looks out over all these Jews, and he says something like, doesn't say this in Scripture, but we get the idea. He looks out on those two million Jews that are now in his backyard, and he goes, Oi. <laughs> Fearing that we would rise up and take his throne, we're slaves. How are they going to do that? He made us miserable, degraded, under the, the whip of the taskmaster, his slaves, his servants. And we cried to God. Now, here's where we get involved. Sitting around the table, we read that part, and the head of the Passover says, you know, we were there in the loins of our forefathers. It's incumbent upon us to imagine that we came through them. What happened to them could have happened to us. And so we take a piece of parsley, and we dip that into salt water. That's the carpus. We dip that in salt water. Why, why carpus, the greens? Because it reminds us of life new life in the springtime. Just as God gave our nation life there in Egypt, we dip it in salt water, symbolic of tears. And what does that remind us of? That we're crying out to God, save us from our misery. The rabbis say it's not enough just to taste the salt water. We have to have our own tears. So we take a piece of matzah, and we take the chazeret, the bitter herbs, the fresh ground horseradish root. You know what this stuff is like? You know what wasabi is? Yeah, this is Jewish wasabi. We get a scoop about this. My grandfather would say, get a scoop about the size of half a teaspoon. We're going to celebrate or experience the weeping of our ancestors. You get it? Right. You get a mouthful of this stuff, and your nose runs, your eyes water, everything starts to turn red, and we call it Jewish Sudafed, because all the, it, it all opens up. Right? And it brings tears to our eyes. We weep with our ancestors. It reminds us in, very often in Jewish life that the tragedies and the traumas that come to our people are shared by all of us. On October 7, when Hamas did what it did and took into slavery, into hostage Jewish people and killed more than 1,200, many of us around the world felt very vulnerable. Many of us felt even worse when we heard of the anti-Semitism that was breaking out on college campuses and in demonstrations. It wasn't just out there in the streets but it touched us in our homes here in America as well. That may be the closest I can bring you to understand what it's like for us at, at Passover to do this. Although at our Passover tables, we're removed by 2,500 years. 3,500 years for, for the, the uh, Egyptian uh, exodus. These events in most recent years, whether it was the Holocaust or whether it was what happened so recently, have a, had a tremendous impact on our people. Very shortly, I'm going to show you a short video of what's happening with our staff in Israel. But we, we remember our part with this, that we were, we were set free. We have um, uh, something else that helps us to remember that not all bad news ends there. We have a mixture made of apples, walnuts, raisins, almonds, brown sugar, wine, and cinnamon. It's called charoset. It's the apple mixture. It's very sweet, and it looks like mud. Now, thinking back to Egypt, we want to remember the bricks that our forefathers made. That was a substance of our labor, but in the bitterest hour of our bondage, the sweetness of God's redemption was drawing near. And so we eat the sweet with the bitter, very Eastern, right? Keep things in balance, always in balance. And so we remember that God's redemption was drawing near to us. Well, the people cried out to God. God heard our cries. He sent Moses to the king of Egypt, to Pharaoh, and he said, let my people go that they may worship their God in the wilderness. Pharaoh says, no, I'm not, we're not going to do that. 
You're going to stay here and serve me. The living God said, fine. You want to have a hard heart? I'll show you who's truly the one true living God. And the Lord God brings 10 plagues against the Egyptians to demonstrate really who is in charge. You know, so much in life we think it's all on us. We're sovereign masters of our universe. But it's so good to know that we're not. We can't know the future and we don't need to know the future. It's nice if we could. But it's so much better to say, I trust in the Lord. I trust in you, O oh God, for what I need today and tomorrow and the tomorrow after that. Amen? Amen? My favorite prayer, the one that comes to my lips most often, Lord, I trust you. I don't like what's happening, but I trust you. I trust you. So we take the second cup of the night, and we're going to remember that God brought judgment against the idols of the Egyptians. And there are ten plagues. And each plague has the name of an Egyptian god upon it. I don't have time to go through all ten of these. I'll just tell you a sh shorthand for some of this. Blood, that was the god Nilas, the god of the Nile River. What happens during the first plague? The Nile River turns to... Nilas is dead. His banks are filled with blood, not water. You can't irrigate, navigate, hydrate with blood. Nilas is finished. The highest of all the Egyptian gods was Ra the sun. That night, sorry, that day of that plague, God puts his hand over the sun, brings about a darkness so thick you could feel it, and he declares, do not worship the creation, worship your creator. Ra is finished. The last plague was against Pharaoh. Pharaoh said his father was the sun god and that he was God incarnate. And the living God judges Pharaoh and his nation because Pharaoh said every firstborn male, man and beast, was a priest to him. Every firstborn male, man and beast. So one night, Yahweh is going to slay every single firstborn male in the land. Think that would get a message across to Pharaoh and the people? That's exactly why it, was, why it happened. And on that night, God told us, very simply, that we were to go at once and take the animals, the lambs for yourself. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 and 22. He said, on that night of that last final plague, you're going to gather in your homes, but go at once and select the animals, the lambs for your families, and slaughter the Passover lamb. That's where the name comes from. He calls it the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop. It's a leafy or feathery bush. I'm just going to use this to demonstrate this. Dip the hyssop into the blood. Remember, the lamb was slaughtered, blood drained off into a basin. The father stands in the house, dips hyssop into the blood, and he's told, sprinkle it, the blood, on both sides of the doorframe and on the top. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. This is the Lord's Passover. Now, I want you to see this because it's hard to imagine in our eyes, but picture the doorway. As a father dips hyssop into the blood and to seal, and to seal the door with a sign, he splashes it on the lentil and the two side posts. And a bloody sign is formed over the door. On the lentil and the two side posts. And when God comes upon the land of Egypt and sees the blood on the houses where we are living, he said, I will pass over you if you dwell in that home so that no death, judgment, or destruction falls upon those who've trusted in the blood of the Lamb. Can you understand why I love this festival so much? The picture of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by whom we pass from death into life is depicted in the Hebrew Scriptures, waiting to be fulfilled in the coming of the Lord Jesus. 
At this point in our Passover, the story has been told. We sit back and eat a meal, relieved to know that, this, that God who is, was there in Egypt is with us even today. But I want to show you, as I promised just briefly, in about a little two-minute, two-and-a-half-minute video, what's happening in Israel. Jewish people over there are going to celebrate Passover in a remarkable and a very deep way this year. Most people think of Jews for Jesus, and they think, of, well, we're here in New York City and in Los Angeles. The largest branch of Jews for Jesus was established in the year 2000 when I filed papers with the government of Israel to re re register Jews for Jesus there. It's called Yehudim Laman Yeshua in Hebrew as a nonprofit religious organization that is constituted to make the Messiahship of Jesus known to the people of Israel, all the people of Israel, from the Old and the New Testament. We have about uh, eight missionaries in Los Angeles. They have about 14 or 15 in New York. In Israel today, we have 55 missionaries, all of whom are Israeli citizens, if the government of Israel closes down all mission work in the land of Israel and kicks out all foreign missionaries, for us, nothing changes. The people you're about to see are people who work with our branch in Tel Aviv uh, and Jerusalem. Some of them are soldiers, both men and women in the IDF. Some are reservists. They've been stationed down at Hamas in, uh, in Gaza and on the, the Lebanese border but they have been ministering to their fellow Israelis and Arabs in the, in the region ever since. And continue, they were doing that long before, but ever since October 7, they've been doing this. Maybe we can show the, the video. It's only about two and a half minutes. The war affected our team. Uh, some of our staff live in cities that are bombed severely, so some of them even lost friends. We all know either firsthand or secondhand people who have lost loved ones in those terror attacks. There has been a rise in anti-Semitism and we're a part of the Jewish community, so we have felt the hatred. I think the people of Israel feel uh, hopeless and fearful about the future and uh, they don't know what's ahead. So many in Israel are not only living in fear, but living without the hope of redemption in Messiah. Very few people believe in Jesus, maybe less than 1%. Most of the Israelis do not have access to New Testament uh, in their native language. Uh, more than 100,000 residents of Israel were evacuated from their homes. They needed care. The Lord calls me to visit and to comfort and bring food. There were weeks that we've sent 5,000 packages of food to families throughout Israel. We have been producing animated um, verses from the Book of Psalms just to uplift um, Israelis. God is opening up people's hearts to the Gospel right now in ways we have never seen before. We've received over 600 requests for the New Testament in only three months. We have an opportunity to come alongside them and stand with them and love and support them in ways that are only possible when people hit rock bottom. Jesus' message is one of love, hope, and healing. It is relevant for Israel is now more than ever. Just encourage your Jewish neighbors, encourage your Jewish friends with prayer, with visits. Would you pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Would you pray for the salvation of the Jewish people? Together we can love and serve the people of Israel. There may be Jewish people here in the United States that you might have an opportunity to minister to. You can minister with us to the people in Israel. Uh, whatever is given tonight in the offering, whatever you choose to do, is going to go for our brothers and sisters who are over there now um, serving. You know, they said they gave out 600, 600 Hebrew language New Testaments about Jesus in the first three months after October 7th. They've continued to do that in incredible numbers. We've never seen the kind of openness that's available now to, to minister the gospel. 
We have a branch. We have branches in Ukraine as well, in Kiev, in Odessa. They said when Russia invaded Ukraine, it was bad for Ukraine. It was good for the gospel. We've seen more people coming to faith in Christ in both countries since the terrible things have happened. I don't wish that on any culture, any country, any society. But we have to remember that sometimes in the midst of the bad news, there really is good news. Well, you get a chance to do that later on. Uh, we'll come back. Right now, I, I want to focus us from this table to that one. Because what you're about to see is the, the whole context, the backdrop to why we go to that table as often as you do these things. To remember our redemption in the Lord's Passover through Jesus the Messiah. So at our Passover dinners, we would, um, we'd come back to the table after we, we'd eaten. We'd be talking for a while. And then there's a signal given to the children to run and look for a piece of matzah that was broken, wrapped in linen, and buried for a time. We didn't forget that, did we? No, we bring that back out. The father unwraps it. He uh, gives thanks over it after breaking it. We break off small pieces, the size of an olive. Each person is given a piece of matzo. My grandfather did this. My grandfather came from Belarus. He could barely speak English. Um, he left Belarus because his father was murdered in a pogrom, just because he was Jewish. But we come and we would break the bread, and he would give us little pieces. My father did the same thing, remembering his family and our family today. I did this and continue to do this. In fact, I'm going to be up in, in Oregon with our family to celebrate Passover. And we'll break that bread in little pieces together. And then we say a, a blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alam. Hamotze lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has brought forth bread from the earth. The bread that was broken, wrapped in linen buried and brought back out. The Lord Jesus did this very thing. In the midst of his Passover, we read some unusual words that are never said otherwise. Not till, not till his Passover. He took some bread, he gave it, uh, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As often as we take that bread, we remember the body of the Lord Jesus, who on the day before the Shabbat, on Friday night, was crucified, killed in place of you and me for our sin, that we might pass from death into life that no death, judgment, or destruction would fall upon us. And we remember with thanksgiving what he's done for us. We'll do that in just a few moments. The next thing we do at Passover is we pick up the third cup of the night, which is the cup of redemption. We remember our redemption from slavery in Egypt. We rejoice to give thanks to God for all that he has done on our behalf. And then we find that Jesus, in the midst of that pa his Passover, gave this cup a new meaning. But we're told, and this is very interesting, it says, Luke says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. Why did Luke add those words? Who would, who would mind what cup it was? Well, it's a very special cup. The cup of redemption is the one that Jesus raised. The cup that we remember that we were released from slavery. We were redeemed out of slavery. And to those of us who have been redeemed from the Egypt of sin, Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to do these things in just a second. Now that we know where it all came from, I just want to remind you that when Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood, he was 
quoting from the prophet Jeremiah, who said that he would accomplish, God would accomplish, a renewal of the covenant through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant of blessing, with a promise that we would not have to teach others about knowing God, because we would know him not just privately, not privately, personally, but not privately. He wanted us to tell others that the Holy Spirit would come and live with inside of us, give us a new heart and a new life, and our sin would be forgiven. So tonight, we're going to come to the table and we're going to do these things. The, the Passover ends with a joyous cry. The last cup is raised, the cup of praise, and we say, Hodu ladonai ki tov ki leolam chasto. Give thanks to the Lord because he's good and his mercy endures forever and ever and ever. My brothers and sisters, this is the time we come to the table. This is our opportunity to actually do this. You're welcome to come to the table if you have confessed your sin and you recognize that Jesus, by what he did to redeem you from the Egypt of sin, poured out his blood for you on the cross of Calvary. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you have acknowledged that, just said thanks to him, you're more than welcome to come to his table and do these elements because it means something to you. If you've never done that, you can do it tonight. As you come to this table, you can simply say in your heart, Lord, I know I am broken. I am a sinner. I have been in a delusion just like Adam and Eve. But now I know that I cannot make myself holy or right. Only by what you have done to demonstrate your love for me by dying in my place can I find hope, deliverance, and salvation. If you do that, you're welcome to come to the table. If you've long done that before, please come to his table and know that, that your redemption is what you celebrate in this moment. I'm going to ask us to, to do this together in just a moment. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to stand, please. Will come up as, as your, your practice. But this might be a moment for you to simply say, uh, before you come up, Lord, forgive me for whatever. Lord, come to my life this night in a renewed and special way. I love you. If you've never done that before, as I suggested, you can simply say, Lord, I am broken and a sinner. I believe now I've been saved by the grace of Jesus. Come, bring me to you. Be my Savior. You're welcome to come to the Lord's table. Let me offer a word of prayer, and then please come and, and take the elements. Heavenly Father, we say thanks, thanks be to you, for you are good, and your mercy endures forever and ever. You have welcomed us to the table because Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Let us rejoice in this moment together. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please come and take when you're ready.
Jesus was born to die. He was born to be that lamb, the seed of the woman. To the channel of blessing, as I said, it could have been any nation. The one in which he was born through provided for all of us the salvation in his body and blood. At Passover, he turns to his disciples. He takes a piece of bread that reminded us of our redemption from slavery in the land of Egypt. And then he turns to each one and he says, you know, as often as you do this, remember me. My brothers and sisters, you're welcome to come to the Lamb's table because he has sacrificed himself for us. Let's eat the bread. The cup after supper, the cup of redemption. We drink with thanksgiving for our redemption from the, the horror of being separated from God, of living in a world without hope, a world without promise, to a world of eternal life and redemption. We give thanks to God for the blood of life which has been given to us by the, the Lamb of God, in his name we give thanks. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Richard. Thanks so much. You may be seated. Ah. Next year with Christ. <laughs> with Christ. <laughs> Thank you. I knew I was going to forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you've all been uh, blessed by uh, the sermon and the Cedar uh, presentation by Tuvia. We're so thankful for uh, you for coming out to uh, bless us and serve us uh, this evening. At this moment, we're going to take um, an offering uh, for the Jews for Jesus ministry. Uh, their mission is to relentlessly pursue God's plan for the salvation of the Jewish people. Um, and aren't you just uh, thankful to God that God is uh, salvation for the Jews and also uh, for the, the Gentiles, for all of us as well? Um, so if you want to support and bless the work of this ministry, you can put uh, whatever amount um, in the offering plate as it's being passed around in our offering song. Um, you can also give online, so if you prefer to, prefer to do that, you can go to their website, which is jewsforjesus.org. Um, and just a reminder, um, hopefully you guys all got uh, one of these brochure pamphlets. Um, and I encourage all of you, whether you, you want to um, uh, give a donation or not, that you fill this out and leave it with uh, with Tuvia so that uh, you can at least receive your free uh, PDF of his, uh, of his little book. 
Um, so if you want to join me in prayer for the offering, our gracious Father, um, we thank you that all um, good things come from you. Uh, Lord, that you have given us life and you've given us hope. And you have also given us uh, forgiveness and redemption through your son, Jesus Christ, uh, in whom we remember the redemption that we have through him uh, today. Uh, Lord, may you continue to bless the Jews for Jesus ministry as they have been relentlessly pursuing um, their this desire and passion uh, to bring the gospel um, to your uh, special people, the Jews, that they may come to know that salvation comes from your son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, thank you for all the um, missionaries uh, here in the States as, as, as well as in Israel who are doing the work of the kingdom. And we also thank you for your servant, Tuvia, uh, who was able to come to bless us um, this evening. Uh, so, Lord, uh, with the uh, amounts that we um, freely give uh, and donate, Lord, may you use it uh, to uh, spread the gospel and to spread your kingdom. And we pray this in, these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.
invite you to stand as we sing our last song, Worthy is a Lamb. And we just declare that our God, our King, is worthy of all our praise.
Would you bow your heads with me? Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And all God's people say together, amen. That Friday 2,000 years ago was the single most horrible day in the history of the world, and the Son of God was betrayed, tortured, and crucified. And yet what man meant for evil, what Judas meant for evil, what the Jewish leaders meant for evil, what Pilate meant for evil, and what people meant for evil, praise the Lord that God meant it all for good. Amen. I have two quick announcements for us before you dismiss. Uh, first, this Sunday is our Easter service Sunday and baptism, uh, and it will begin at 10 a.m. Uh, corporate prayer will begin at 9.30, so I invite all of you guys to come at 9.30 to join us in worship, in prayer, and then we'll begin our Easter baptism service at 10 a.m. Uh, also, two of you, thank you again for coming out uh, we were so blessed by you this evening. Uh, Tuvia is going to be in the back by the uh, uh, the back table uh, where he has all his uh, different materials. So uh, I encourage you to drop by, say hi to him. If you have any questions, uh, he'll be back there to answer questions. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So have a good night and hope to see you on Sunday. <laughs>